good afternoon on behalf of india international center and on my own behalf i extend a warm welcome to the distinguished panelists and the audience <clears throat> to this program where our conversation will be centered around father of india's nuclear program and a stalwart of scientific research in india we're going to discuss a book titled homi je bhava a renaissance man among scientists to discuss the book we are joined by an eminent panel of speakers we have with us professor r rajaraman going to moderate the session dr anil kumar mishra dr r k watts and dr biman nath who is also the author of the book it's my pleasant privilege to introduce the moderator of this program professor raja raman an emeritus professor of theoretical physics at the school of physical sciences at jawaharlal nehru university he was also the co-chairman of the international panel of physical materials and a member of the bulletin of the atomic scientists science and security board he has taught and conducted research in physics at the indian institute of science the institute for advanced study at princeton and as a visiting professor at stanford harvard mit and other institutions with this brief uh a description may i request the moderator professor r rajaram to conduct the session over to you sir thank you very much uh so uh, is my audibility clear i think it is yes yes it is let thank you so let me begin by first thanking dr usha munshi the chief librarian at iic uh, is an old friend we have known each other for the days when she was working in insa Uh, thank you for inviting me to participate in this webinar. I would also like to thank uh, Ms. Kanchan Nagpal, the assistant librarian, for her courtesy on the logistics. I might have tried her patience once or twice, but she was always patient and courteous. Now, the order of in which I thought I would uh, set up this program today uh, is that uh, often the chairman of session want to take the chairmanly privilege and hold forth at the beginning. I want to avoid that. I'll speak last. I'll first request Dr. Mishra in a minute, and after that, Dr. Vatsa. I'll introduce them appropriately. Then I'll say a few words, and then we will hand it over to uh, Dr. Biman uh, Nath for his responses and his experiences and motivations for writing this book. And that will be followed by a period of questions and answers. If there are questions, it is requested that the questions be put in the in written form in the chat box, and I'll direct them to the appropriate person. So, uh, with this, uh, it gives me great pleasure to invite uh, Dr. Anil Kumar Mishra to uh, speak to us. Dr. Mishra uh, is now currently the director of the Institute for Nuclear Medicine in Allied Sciences. He has received a large number of awards, uh, most prominent of which perhaps the DRDO Young Scientist Award given by the Prime Minister. He got that way back in 1999. His interests are in radio chemistry, metal chemistry, radio pharmaceutical sciences, and development of molecular imaging probes. So, may I request Dr. Mishra to give his response to the book? Dr. Mishra, please. Very good afternoon to all of you. Those who are viewing uh, online, it's my great pleasure to um, to attend this uh, panel discussion. and thankful to dr nath dr rajaramanna sandeep dr munshi bas to invite me to share my views very delighted and i let me congratulate professor nath to really bring a book that talks about uh, modern india means pioneering the modern india is a very appropriate word that the sentence has been chosen and very appropriately brought about सर होमी जहांगीर भाभा इट्स एनी थिंग यू टॉक इज वेरी स्मॉल इज वेरी लाउड एंड क्लियर नेम यू कैन यू कैन यू कैन यू कैन से अबाउट होमी जहांगीर भाभा वेन एवर आई वॉज वॉकिंग थ्रू दिस बुक आई रियलाइज दैट द चाइल्ड चैलेंज द वर्ल्ड विथ विजडम थ्रू साइंस एंड टेक्नोलॉजी दिस इज वॉट आई वॉज गोइंग थ्रू द बुक वेन आई रेड इट that has served the society in a different perspective 
And that has is brought in the second half of his book that how the country society in large get benefited out of his work uh, by Dr. Baba, Mami Jangir Baba, who is called the father of nuclear power of this country. Uh, you will, all will agree with me. Once upon a time, Gandhiji will never agree with us to use any nuclear power. But if he was alive today, he will certainly thank each one of us that how nuclear power is being used for peaceful application. And that was the, his one of uh, meeting who he has attended in Geneva. And then he talked about that, how we can use the peace uh, atom for the peace. When it comes in the domain of talking science and technology through nuclear power, either the power of nuclear energy, you talk about any sector that has been described in this book very nicely. So three names comes quite often when we talk is always associated with it. One is Bikram Sarabhai. We talk about that in space research that whatever we have been using. Um, the third part comes about that uh, Brigadier Santosh Kumar Majumdar. The, these three are associated very nicely. Associated nicely reason being is that how we can really utilize um, this nuclear power for um, application in, uh, in health, either in the sector that we want to do. Uh, I'm not able to share my uh, screen right now, um, but um, let me see once again if it, I, I'm able to share it. Um, that um, if you look about um, anything that we, we talk about, Homi uh, Jahangir Baba is very nicely uh, put in one slide. He's an international nuclear physicist, is known to all of us, did his PhD in 32 way back. And then when he spoke in UN conference about peaceful uses of atomic energy in Geneva in 1955, and that is the day we cherish all of us, that how we can harbor, how we can really uh, utilize this energy for the application that can be very useful, but useful to all of us uh, in the country. Looking at this in the book, is begin is very nicely mentioned about that is a scientist administrator visionary musician artist national builder that what i would like to say over here is that in his book that he was a person to talk about the technology of tomorrow is not the technology of today either yesterday and that builds the nation reason being that if it was not thought of if his vision was not there there are many technology of tomorrow. We had to borrow it from outside the country. That vision he has got. And that's why you can see that so many awards goes to his credit, including being a stamp for the country, getting many times nominated for Nobel Prize. It's very nicely mentioned in this book. Uh, walking through Einstein, either the big, uh, uh, wh whosoever you can talk about in the, in the field of nuclear science, either physics, that they have worked, either he has worked with him, either they share the knowledge many times it has been mentioned in the book. What um, I like about this total book is that it's talked about uh, nuclear energy, either nuclear power in um, its sector, like you have energy, you have agriculture, you have got um, uh, many, many domain that we talk about the defense. But when I was reading page number 171, uh, something like that, in that was mentioned something about Commissioner Energy Atomic. And then there I realized that what a strong relation we had with the French nationals and our Indian national to harbor this nuclear energy and none uh, less than Brigadier Santosh Kumar Majumdar. He is the founder of Institute of Nuclear Medicine and is called the father of nuclear medicine of this country was could not have been possible if Baba has not realized the power of nuclear energy can go and can be shared, either can be seen, something really deep seated that we cannot see by any technology. So is the power of nuclear energy and that's why the BARC came in the picture. And you can see that the what exactly uh, uh, Baba has told about that no more war, the same thing Brigadier S.K. Majumdar told no war in 1958, just three years later. And to harness this uh, energy for peaceful use, and that can be seen in a very nice way. Today, 
If you talk about the nuclear medicine technology, you can see the one image that I'm sharing. Anything hidden, any type of disease we talk about, either is a neurological disorder, Either you talk about oncological disorder, you talk about infection. Very recently, we all have witnessed the COVID to visualize it. And to visualize, you need to have the electromagnetic radiation. And this electromagnetic radiation with the shorter wavelength, with the longer energy can be realized. I would like to share a couple of things that was missing in this book, but is the beauty because he has talked, Professor Nath has talked about the power of nuclear energy. And you can see in the consecutive slides that how powerful it is. You can imagine that we have 293 hospitals today. It has now gone to 400 to 500. And you can see, imagine about this molybdenum 99, that is one of the work horse that we use for nuclear scan, costing in billions of dollars. And every year we do 1.25 million nuclear scan. You can imagine about the health. You can imagine about the uh, economical saving of this country that could have gone outside the country. It was possible because of the Bhava. He has realized that if we don't harbor the technology today, certainly we'll borrow it tomorrow. So this all goes credit to um, the cyclotron, either you talk about the nuclear reactor, either you talk about the cell that has been established long by back. Um, it's these two institutions like BRC and Defense Research Development Organization. So imagine that uh, if, if, if you were not able to establish this center, these all radionuclides that we talk about, we could have borrowed from outside the country. And this is the, going to be the medicine of tomorrow. And that's, you can see one of the slides that I'm sharing here is that the gallium 68, one of the isotope is being produced now in this country. And you can see the micrometastatic lesion even is hidden in the liver, either is hidden in the brain. It's just such nice, either wonderful work that you can imagine. It's only because of the nuclear power and the nuclear energy. And I, I always try to say is a neon that is nuclear energy in oncology and neurology that we are going to witness. You can see this, that what is possible with this one, the cancer, deadly disease. We talk about the Siddharth Mukherjee book, Emperor of all the Maladi. You can see such a nice system by using some of the radioisotope. You talk about carbon 11, you talk about chlorine 18, either you talk about anything that we can, we can design, we can develop was possible only because Bhava has realized that we have to have this type of system for other application that we are going to talk about the health besides uh, energy, either you talk about agriculture, either you talk about any defense sector that being used uh, nuclear power to, to maintain the peace, either to make the life peaceful and healthy and wealthy to, 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 to see that people are not suffering up any kind of disease. You can imagine by looking at the images, you can see that images in the brain such nicely, the contrast you can see where tumor is located is not possible with any modalities. You talk about uh, computer tomography, you take, talk about magnetic resonance imaging, you talk about any technology that exists today, non-invasively is possible only because we have the nuclear energy and the father is of course, Homi Jahangir Bhabha, Sir Homi Jahangir Bhabha and is carried forward by Brigadier S.K. Majumda, who is the father of nuclear medicine of this country. You imagine that it's such a beautiful images that we get is only because this lutetium is produced in BARC and that goes all over the country. Credit goes once again to, um, to Sir Homi Jahangir Bhava that he has thought about this, that we have to have, that we should not borrow from outside. We should not accumulate the nuclear waste in this country. And it was only uh, uh, possible because uh, we had put all these three people together, Brigadier uh, S.K. Majumdar, uh, Vikram Sarabhai, as well as uh, uh, you know, the father of nuclear power that we have been discussing today in this book, uh, Sir Homi Jahangir Baba. With this, I would like to really say this book is compiled in such a nice way uh, that gives uh, technology for tomorrow to this country, starting from his childhood to challenging the world. Either you talk about any sector, uh, and that with this, I pay my homage. I congratulate Professor Nath that he has compiled book in such a nice way that any, anyone can read, can go through and can really aspire and inspired with this one 
to, to do the science in a very defined manner with a good wisdom. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Rajan Manna. Allow me to, to share my thoughts about uh, uh, his invention, his technology for today or for tomorrow, either for the future. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mishra, uh, for giving us so much useful information about the medical aspects of what came out of uh, Bhava's nuclear enterprises. And thank you also for sticking to the time. I want to make a small comment. Uh, there are two people involved in the nuclear business. One is Raja Ramana, the other is me. And Raja Raman, they're very different from each other. And we are on opposite sides of the nuclear debate. Uh, and poor man, he's no longer with us to be able to defend himself. So I have to say that we are two different people. It's just a remark, just, to, just in case somebody else uh, is listening. Now let me invite us for the next presentation, Dr. R.K. Vatsa. Dr. Vatsa is, uh, if I have it correct, uh, heading the Structural Chemistry Division of BARC now. And uh, uh, he was Vice President of the, or currently is the Vice President of the Indian Society of Mass Spectroscopy. He was elected a Fellow of uh, INSA some time back. Uh, and uh, uh, he will be telling us about, uh, I presume, the chemical aspects of uh, uh, Baba's entrepreneurship. Uh, please, Dr. Ratsa. Thank you, Professor Rajaran. <clears throat> I mean, it was such a great pleasure to have this book, which was initially sent to uh, Vyasa, Chairman Atomic Energy Commission, and then uh, he forwarded it to me. And while reading this book, which now is in my hands here, and I was wondering why it is so similar to the book that we have produced here. So we have produced just a few months back a book on homeopathy, and they were going almost parallel in stool. And I immediately looked at the bibliography and I found that we have uh, taken references from the common, several references were common. So it seemed very familiar for me to read. The book is beautifully written, much more beautiful than what we have. I mean, anybody who wants a copy of this book can write to us, it's given, and we'll be happy to provide. And uh, Dr. Bhava is a national hero. You can call it scientific hero, national scientific hero. And in my opinion, I mean, Professor Anil Mishra has given a great account of what he did as far as radio pharmaceutical was concerned. But Bhava was a complete scientist. He was not only a theoretical physics, he realized he will need chemistry, he will need metallurgy, he will need radiation biology, he will need so many things to have this program grow step by step. And that, that's how he started Nuclear, nuclear Agriculture and Bio, uh, Biology Division, Division, Biosciences Group, uh, along with Professor Majumdar now, uh, this in mass and several other, other things. So he was in a true sense a visionary. As I could see from uh, the slides of Professor Mishra, he mentioned several things and we have also copied three in this case. It's a scientist, it's a scientist, visionary, and an artist. Okay, so these are the three things, and truly he was. So I have read this book carefully, quite carefully. I, you will apologize me that I could only go through about 50% of the book. And in my opinion, from the life of Dr. Homi Baba, there are a few takeaways for audience here. Number one thing is that one needs to be passionate about what you do. For this, if you remember, he fought with his father and he said, I mean, there is no point telling me that engineer, let people become engineer. It's a great thing for them. The physics is my line. I'm burning with the desire to do physics. He was hardly 17, 18 at that point, And he bargained his father and father said, okay, I'll sponsor. Fine, no problem. And when you look back, the important thing is Baba started TIFR somewhere around 1945. To be precise, I think it was about 19 June or so. And we lost him in an air crash on 24th January, 1966. So this gives him roughly about 20 years of his time. But this 20 years he spent in such a passionate and dedicated manner that today when we look what India has achieved in that short time in nuclear science and technology and in general science, it appears to be a very, very superhuman effort. Imagine he was talking of nuclear technology at a time when India was importing bicycles. I mean, you must be knowing that these were the railway bicycles coming from UK. This was the time. And he was dreaming of nuclear power plants. In it. This is Baba. Then he was very, very particular about being patriot. Dr. Baba was a very, very successful theoretical physicist. We all know. 
all the celebrated scientists and you know, Nobel Prize winners such as Niels Bohr, Albert Einstein, Paul Dirac, Fermi, Wolfgang Pauli, they have collaborated with him or at least they had some contact with him. And had he, uh, had he gone back to Europe after the Second World War, I'm sure that he would have probably got a Nobel Prize. However, he sacrificed his personal gains to remain in India, to nurture science and technology here. And he said, why not? I mean, we can do good science even here as well. And this gave a certain boost, a good amount of boost in those times. And thanks to his very personal relation, relations, so-called, he used to call uh, Pandit Nehru as Bhai. So these relations gave an impetus to the general science, in science in general and nuclear science and technology in particular. One quote which I would like to tell from there, he said, Baba said, and I quote, this was 7th January 1966, maybe about two to three weeks just before we lost him. Baba said, and I quote, a booster in the form of a foreign collaboration can give a plane an assisted takeoff, but it will be incapable of independent flight unless it is powered by engines of its own. If Indian industry is to take off and be capable of Indian fl independent flight, it must be powered by the science and technology based in the country. So Baba realized very early that you have to have your own science, you have to have your own technology. You can have one or two instruments, none, absolutely no harm. But finally, it is the backbone scientists, the technologists of this country who have to take this forward. It will not survive completely on foreign collaboration. The third important aspect that Baba's personality had, he believed in his team. He had tremendous faith. So the typical example is a Cyrus reactor. When Cyrus reactor was built, it was running almost at uh, half the power. And he wasn't very happy, if I, to be precise, 17 megawatt. It's designed for 40 megawatt. And he said the Canadians had left. And he called all the people, the analytical chemistry people, the radiation biology. There was some fungi growth. They cleaned it up and made it brought to 40 megawatt. He said Indians can do anything and everything that is expected of them. So he had tremendous faith in his team. And he always believed that whatever good work you do, it must be good for the science. It must benefit the subject as well as it must benefit the society. So this is what Baba was in brief. Professor Mishra has given good account of radio pharmaceuticals. So I need not go into that side. Now, while making this book, I do not know about Dr. Professor Biman Nath, but I really had a very, very, very serious issue that how to describe Dr. Baba. I mean, he had so many qualities, how to describe him. I found it very difficult. We read nearly thousand pages about Dr. Baba and the closest narration that comes to describe Dr. Baba is by late Sri J.R.D. Tata, the famous indigenist and a personal friend of Dr. Homi Baba. Sri Tata said, and I quote once again here, the most outstanding of the distinguished men I have known was undoubtedly Homi Baba. In addition to the intellectual gifts nature had bestowed on him, he was a visionary with boldness and relentless energy and the drive to convert his vision into reality. Homi was one of those who made me believe that some men in human history are born with a stamp of predestination on them to accomplishment beyond ordinary human capabilities. A scientist, an engineer, a master institution builder, an administrator steeped in humanity, arts and music, Homi was truly a complete man." Unquote. This is what JRD has to say about Homi Baba. Such was the greatness of Homi Baba. And in brief, Sir C. V. Raman at the annual meeting of Indian Academy of Science, Nagpur, 1941, introduced Dr. Baba as, Baba is a great lover of music, a gifted artist, a brilliant engineer, and an outstanding scientist. He is the modern equivalent of Leonardo da Vinci. So these two are more or less similar. And this has been very well captured in the book of Professor Biman Nath. I read it with great interest. I found it very, very interesting. Thank you. Sir. It's just an honor to be on this panel and discussing about Dr. Baba. I mean, we being in DA just cannot dream of anything better than somebody describing him. And uh, I take this opportunity to thank all the people who have invited me for this purpose and thank Professor Vimanath for bringing out such a wonderful thing, some wonderful book on Dr. Baba. Uh, I, I wish to have few copies in our library 
to tell students and newcomers, I mean, what a personality he was, the legacy that you are in that you own in the form of Baba. Thank you so much, Professor Raja Raman. With this, I close it down. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Vatsa, for your uh, very brief but inspiring presentation about Baba and your alternate viewpoint as somebody who's written a similar book himself. Thank you very much. All of my speakers are doing the opposite of speakers, what they usually do, which is to over, go way beyond their time. Here, everybody is going under your time, so they have lots of time in our hands. Maybe we can use it profitably during the Q&A period. And any of my speakers want to add some more remarks, we can do that also at the end, because we do have some time as well as I can see. So now I will go to uh, uh, my own brief uh, comments about the book. Uh, so first I want to congratulate Dr. Bhiman uh, for you. writing this biography of Bhabha. Uh, it contains lots of pieces of information about Bhabha that I didn't know, although we are uh, years apart, but in the same field. I, there are several things here I didn't know, and I'm very happy to find them in the book. Apart from that, purely from a literary point of view, it's very tastefully written. Thank you. Uh, for instance, the book begins not with the traditional paragraph of details of birth, parentage, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but with the description of the Uti telescope on the Nilgiri Hills. He describes the surrounding atmosphere in running into such a telescope there. And then he describes the astrophysics done there. And from there, he leads us on to the man who made it all possible, namely Homi Baba, and his own Homi Baba's own pioneering work in the field. So it's a very well written book. It reads smoothly. And uh, uh, I congratulate him for this. Thank you. Uh, amongst the important, uh, there are many aspects of Baba's life uh, that are discussed in the book. I'll just pick one or two, which uh, especially. Uh, interest me. One is uh, the issue of uh, possible implications of Baba's overall policy about how to go about building the nuclear enterprise in India. Of course, we all know that he's the father of Indian nuclear uh, enterprise, and we all admire him for the tremendous things he's done. So I'm going to be really talking about the flaws that are there, because there's plenty that has been written about what great amount of work he's done, with which I completely agree. So one of the issues that interested me, which always interested me, which is also brought out in Dr. Nath's book, are the differences, well-known differences between Baba and Saha, both eminent physicists of the time. Uh, so Saha felt that although Baba was undoubtedly a great institution builder, and indeed he was, some of the misgivings that Saha had were, in my opinion, valid. In particular, Saha was concerned about the Baba's approach of building expertise from the top down. So, uh, and I can, I can well understand Baba's motivations for doing this. We were an emerging country and very little was known about the excellence of our people's abilities. And what Baba wanted to do was give an opportunity for the best of the best to come to an institute like TIFR which he built and give them facilities and freedom from bureaucratic lessons so that they can do their work. It's a very, very worthwhile thing to do. But one of the problems was that in the Baba template for science, university research in science did not have much space. Uh, and science development in India, after Baba also continued by his successors in the science Indian leadership has been detrimental to the development of university science. This is a very bad thing. Uh, one should not blame Baba for this. One man can do only one thing, but others are supposed to come and feed in and uh, temper what he's done and make changes wherever they are needed. This really wasn't, hasn't been done. Uh, so the deleterious effects of having science confined to a few apex institutions at one time, TIFR, now IISC in Bangalore has sort of taken the lead. And there are a few others that have grown since then. The very best of Indian science research is in fact being done in these places, which is very good. These places are internationally famous and their science is well projected abroad. That's a good thing. But meanwhile, what are the universities? We have 300 odd universities. Almost all of them have physics departments and chemistry departments. 
and there are decent people hard working people who all stood first in their schools i bet when they were young people all of them are there largely invisible I mean, counting the achievements of indian science and there is a very definite feeling of being let down in university science departments the feeling that they're somehow second class citizens that their access to positions of recognition and and administrative power are limited and so on and so forth that access to funds now largely this is the fault not of dr baba but of the leadership of universities they should have grabbed this thing by the horns and demanded their share of uh, funds and facilities they didn't do it and very few of them had the stature to take on somebody like baba so i don't blame baba for this at all and i blame the rest of us but this was a problem that was anticipated by saha and pointed out by him right in the beginning so i want to bring that up uh, because if we do not spread excellence in science to all the, or majority of the institutes which in fact are the uh, net which picks up majority of people in india india as a nation will continue to underperform by the highest global standards compared to its size and manpower and intellectual traditions in terms of individual achievements yes we have lots of people who have done very good things but a country of this size ought to have a much larger impact at the very highest levels which it doesn't and it's not just a matter of counting nobel prize winners it hardly matters what matters is the next level of serious top world class scientists respected around the world and we don't have enough of them down uh, compared to the size we are as big as europe and we don't have as many as europe as so, so this is one aspect which is hinted at there by in the book by the you know, discussion between saha and baba the other aspect of uh, baba's way of going about things which again i can understand why he did it was in restricting the nuclear enterprise largely to his domain that is bar cti far pae those institutions and very little of the uh, nuclear uh, technology was developed at the universities this is quite the opposite of what happens in other places when i went as a graduate student to cornell in the 50s i was told the right where i was standing underneath there was a react in the physics building it was just a, one of the many universities there uh, so other countries did not take this model the top scientists in the us come from the universities and then some of them go to labs and some of them are then inducted to serve for the country in the manhattan project they go to the manhattan project they come right back to the university so the universities are in fact the place where science is nurtured and that is where the majority of the students go and that is important for the overall development of science commensurate with the population of the people so restricting uh, the nuclear enterprise within the uh, bae domain was again perhaps needed at that time partly because of the weapon side of the nuclear expertise which had to be classified and partly because baba perhaps wanted to make sure even the small number of talented people to put them all in one place rather than spread them out and let them filter out i can understand that argument but in the long run it was not a good thing restricting the expertise also has another consequence that is the problem of opacity and accountability there was hardly anybody outside the dau domain who for a long time could understood what was going on in there when they exploded the bomb we all applauded when they had successes like the built reactors we applauded all this is fine but nobody had any critical questions to ask nobody had the expertise outside the to ask the questions these things changed a little bit when the india us nuclear deal appeared on the scene and suddenly the media and the public started get interested in the indian nuclear enterprise and the media just didn't know where to go to ask their questions so the, this is and similarly when the protest began happening about the reactors in kudankulam we did not have people outside dae to go and tell the public that this is quite safe because the dae people went there but they didn't listen to them because they were from the same side so it was we we suffered a little bit because this concentration of uh, expertise in one air in one agency in the beginning perhaps it might have been justified but long overdue now this is loosened uh, so these are two aspects there i want to uh, mention uh, coming out of the book the, this is not discussed in the book not would it have been appropriate for dr nath to discuss in the book but i i could take the liberty and do it here i have only a few uh, physics statements in the book uh, dr nath which i felt should be modified 
I'm not trying to nitpick on things. A book is such a difficult and important enterprise. A few things here and there do have to be modified. So I just mentioned them to you so that perhaps if you have another edition or you make any changes, these could be corrected. And you can also correct me if I'm wrong. In page 66, you mentioned that Dirac's theory of electrons did not consider spin. Uh, which theory would you be talking about? Because one of the great achievements of the famous Dirac equation was the incorporation of spin in the relativistic context. So perhaps in your response, you can explain what you had in mind. Similarly, on page 130, you say, moderators are used in reactors to control the chain reaction, which would otherwise proceed as a bomb explosion, and the reactor may explode like a bomb. It is true there is a danger of the reactor exploding like a bomb, but that is prevented not by the moderator. In fact, the moderator is trying to improve the reaction rate by slowing down the neutrons that come out because the reaction rate is... Uh, Uh, the reaction rate for fission becomes better at lower energy, so you have to slow down the neutrons that come out. And that is what the moderator does. It's a bad name for the object, because the moderator sounds like it should slow down the reactions. In fact, it increases them. Uh, the process of making sure that the reactor doesn't explode and become a bomb is done by the control rods, which are lowered and raised from time to time. This is again one small thing. And also in page 66, 7, 78, you talk about nucleons, mesons, and isobars. There, some of these notions are a bit mixed up. So I would urge you to please just look at these two minor portions. And please don't take this as a criticism of the book, where all the remaining pages are correct and interesting and very, very valuable. Uh, thank you very much. This is all I want to say. Uh, so now, may I invite uh, Dr. Nath to give his uh, response to this, as well as tell us, uh, as well as tell us his own motivation in trying to do the book and the experiences he had in trying to gather the information and so forth. Dr. Bhiman. Thank you. thank you, Professor Rajanaman. And I should like to thank everybody here, uh, Professor Batsa, Professor Mishra, and the uh, organizers of, uh, from ICC um, uh, to gather the eminent panelists. I, and I use this uh, adjective, uh, you know, very carefully. They, it, it's been uh, very educational to be you know, sitting with you, all of you and to listen to you. Um, Professor Mishra, Professor Vatsa, and uh, Professor Rajanaman, thank you for bringing out those issues that uh, we, a lot of us in the academics have talked about for decades and uh, we know, but um, well, I have a feeling that and I should not say anything as an author of the book under discussion because I suppose whatever needs to be said, the author should have put it in the book. But uh, however, that dictum probably doesn't apply to this monograph on uh, Hobi Baba that I've written for several reasons. Uh, for one, uh, it's a short book, and there was a word limit because of the uh, particular uh, format of the series that the publisher were bringing this out. Uh, so one may think that you know this short book doesn't really do justice to the uh, giant of a person uh, like Baba, and it is true. And I admit that it is difficult, if not impossible, to encapsulate the life and work of Baba, even though his life was cut short by an accident. Um, so what I wanted to do is to engage with the readers in a way to prod their curiosity, especially readers from the younger generation who may not have heard about Baba as much as uh, we from the older generation have. And I wanted to make them curious about Baba's work and legacy so that one you know, would go, go deeper and if one wanted and read up more about him. Uh, uh, and I've worked in the past on some aspects of history of science. And my take on biographies is of scientists is slightly different from others, maybe. But I don't think history of scientists really make for history a good history of science. I mean, in other words, it's not just enough to give a, a, a chronology of one's life events in order to bring out the essence of somebody's life and work and legacy. I mean, it's important to see how his surroundings and the environment in which uh, but one has been brought up or one has worked, how they have shaped his thoughts and work, and also how his thoughts and work have influenced others. So I'm not sure how successful I have been towards this end. Uh, but uh, so that has been my aim throughout writing the book, uh, not a chronology of events, but all, to analyze as much as I could and put them in the perspective of the contemporary zeitgeist, uh, so to say. And thank you for uh, appreciating 
the the way i uh, started the book instead of uh, uh, you know starting with when he was born and uh, where etc cetera, etc cetera. so i wanted to take the readers on an imaginary journey to uti uh, uh, because i am an astronomer as you know and that's something that struck me first um, whenever i visited uh, visited uti of course we uh, we appreciate the work of govin soro but also the man behind the you know vision the um, the way govin sarup and others had approached him whether they could start a radio astronomy group and the alacrity i mean the, the way he had responded bhava had responded and uh, i had um, met some of these people who had approached bhava and they told me their own anecdotes about meeting bhava uh, and how uh, he without bhava radio astronomy wouldn't have uh, flourished uh, and then one sees cosmic ray experiments also on the other side of the hill and uh, that's how i wanted to take the reader on a journey in to make them first interested in the person why would one want to know about bhava at all uh, in this generation and uh, uh, thank you for pointing out some of these you know uh, uh, deficiencies in the book i'll certainly take care of that in the in the future editions thank you so much and i also uh, i i really appreciate professor mishra's uh, talking about the nuclear medicines which is something that i have not had the uh, uh, the time and also the uh, the uh, space room in the book to um, get into so this has been a very educational uh, for me in the today uh, uh, and uh i have a question so uh since all of you are here and i may not have the opportunity later on to ask you uh, since you have talked about nuclear medicines and uh, professor rajaraman also have has uh, talked about uh, meghnatsa's reservations would it have been possible to develop um the nuclear medicine part only through the react uh, without going through the reactors i mean for example which would have probably megnat saha's vision included nuclear medicines uh, use of nuclear uh, nuclear physics without uh, uh, focusing so much on the reactors and which would have made it less less opaque probably in the beginning i always thought about that but i i don't know maybe you uh, since you are all here you can shed some light on that it is a sort of a hypothetical question uh, i i don't know uh, so i is absolutely right um, uh, putting this perspective of nuclear energy uh, like neon always i talk about oncology and neurology brain is not functional even heart is pumping it has got no meaning so when we talk about reactor we always think about the jet value that we are going to hit and to produce the isotope which is medically useful so if you if you accelerate the particle having very high energy and then you have a very uh, 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 target material with a very low z value then you will just break in so many pieces and is very difficult to to really to 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 purify them either to get them but like longer lived like we were talking about molybdenum to produce the technetium to use that is the workhorse the substitute of this reactor now it has come is called cyclotron so in cyclotron you can accelerate with the medium energy the particles both uh, you can accelerate proton as well as deuteron and you can really customize the energy to hit the low z value to produce very useful isotope that can be used for the life sciences and that's why that now you can see the mushrooming mushrooming of cyclotron all over the country that also is not very good because we are going to accumulate the uh, so many nuclear waste today or tomorrow the another other other part that can be done very nicely with the synchrotron the synchrotron again it has got a very high energy that we have got in cat in the so then if we accelerate if either we can really shunt and then to get the appropriate energy keeping in view of the whatever cross section that we are going to hit then you can produce this isotope so this is the one part that is required to detect which is not possible with any nucleide either you talk about optical either is the medical the second part is comes that how you can load it to a target molecules which recognizes the site where it has to go 
is just like a missile. So it's a targeted missile. If I want to send it to the brain, then again, I have to design the molecule where chemistry popped in. And then biology, they, they try to really figure out that who, which recognition moiety that I have to attach and to do the radio chemistry in a very fancy way, not to destroy the biological property of any molecule, and then you can detect it. So today, we were just on detection till uh, maybe five, 10 years back. But today now we are going to really substitute many oncological molecule that was being used for therapeutic molecules that was used in oncology like antibody, chemotherapy, all these things. Going to take over by this uh, radionuclide which are beta negative, either alpha emitters. So this can be again produced by the cyclotron and of course the reactor, you can, if you have, then you can produce with a very high Z value, like you can produce actinium-225, you can produce astatine-211, um, and that can be used for the alpha therapy. So this is uh, the substitute for the reactor. And now we have at least uh, seven to nine cyclotron in this country is located at different location to produce the isotope. One of them is in Kolkata, 30 MeV cyclotron we have got, but there are mostly a medium energy 16.8 to uh, 30 MeV cyclotron we have got almost uh, many in this country. That is an alternative for the electro medicine. Thank you. In fact, uh, one of the things we wondered at that time was Dr. Bhabha, why he didn't go into the accelerator business in as big a way as he could have. Uh, because Dr. Saha was doing it, he was building a cycle. Yes, yes. exactly, yeah. exactly. And so if as much uh, support had been given to Saha to build synchrotrons, of course, Baba tried to get a beta tron and he couldn't yes. get it. I think it's mentioned right. in the book because GE would not sell it. At that time, the US was quite paranoid about exporting anything at all, which is remotely nuclear because of the Manhattan Project and its after effects. So, but uh, uh, Dr. Saha had already built a cycle. Yes. So he had the expertise and he could have developed on that and built large accelerators, uh, uh, which he didn't have the opportunity, maybe by then he had lost interest or got involved in other political issues. But it remains as an open question uh, connected again to the concentration in one place. Because yes. as Dr. Mishra points out, using a rea accelerator to produce isotopes is a different way of doing it as an alternative. And many cyclotrons are doing it now. And uh, it, it not, need not have been only reactors. As you said, reactors, they don't come in smithereens in pieces. It's available in more substantial form. Uh, so let me get back to the schedule here. Vibhan, are you, uh, you want to make any other comments before I uh, bring it up to the question? No, so I just wanted to uh, yeah, thank you for clarifying this. This is a very interesting issue. And I, I always thought about this. Uh, since Magnat, since you brought up Magnat Saha's uh, uh, reservations, and um, but at the same time, as you also correctly said, that you know one uh, one can uh, you know criticize now uh, after so many decades. At that time, what was needed? It's very difficult to judge uh, what could have been done, what should have been done. But you know, he was what uh, in impresses me about Dr. Bhava is that, you know, he was a man of action. He not only had these ideas, but uh, he also got this thing. So was also uh, Saha. I mean, they were all both. Um, and uh, uh, it's it's history, how it plays out, you know, uh, and, uh, but Bhava didn't have this luxury of looking back on his life and what he has done. His life was cut short by an accident. And that, that is right. we, we have the luxury of looking back in history. Sure. Yeah. As you rightly say, a person has done several great things. It's not correct to ask him, why don't you do also this, 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 that addition? And one doesn't have the advantage of hindsight. Uh, in fact, I often say that the best person who could have undone some of the damage Baba did was Baba himself. Had he been around, had he been around, he would have quickly realized the fault lines there and would perhaps have fixed some of them. But I completely agree with everybody's sentiment that Baba was a great man. Silly for me to say it, that's so self-evident. It's clearly true. Uh, but certain directions have to be pulled back again. Uh, Dr. Vatsa, you want to say anything about any of these things? Yeah, <clears throat> I partly agree. Just one thing uh, but, uh, I'd like to add that on your book, page number 124, you have discussed about Meghnath uh, Saha and uh, uh, is, is, is that both of them, they have complement, complemented each other. It was not a kind of a discussion, not liking each other either, uh, not, uh, you know, the theoret theoretician versus experimentalist, either something. But it was a discussion that also gave some fruit to us 
to think and to work on this direction. So any discussion has taken place is really guided us to really work on that direction. Very right. true, very true. Dr. Mish, what's up? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, Dr. Baba was not against any university system. Okay, let me point out he, as, as I can see here, he once wrote the separation of advanced scientific and technical teaching from research is not desirable since those who are outstanding research workers and have made most important contributions to the progress of their subject are usually those who can teach it best to the others. The separation of research from teaching can only be detrimental to both. This is what Baba's views were. All right. So he was definitely not against. In fact, those people, those people at DA, those I must say, those fortunate people at DA who had the chance to work with him, they clearly said that Baba never wanted it to be concentrated here. He wanted that people should be trained here for maybe five years, 10 years, 15 years there, and then go back to universities, share your knowledge, enhance their so-called capacity building. He very much wanted it. Now, why it did not happen is, is another question. Okay, it could be left to the individual, it could be left to the system of switching over, it could be as simple as that, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, I'm just lazy enough not to move out. I mean, comfort zone, I, I just don't want to go out of my comfort zone, something like this, number one thing. And comparing, uh, I think, reactors with this, probably it boils down to, I think, effective cross-section of producing it, Dr. Nath. I think in those days, technology for cyclotron, see, Baba realized one thing very well, now, when we had three different type of reactors to be built, so he knew this will require this, this will require this. So for him, the easy option was like we have so many uh, PHWRs, which is pressurized heavy water reactors. So he realized that uranium resources are very limited in India. Okay. Now, whatever we have, small things probably we can get. Enrichment technology will be difficult to get it. Also, if we start creating, we'll be behind. So the best thing is to create heavy water, which he can do. And he started a plant in Nangal. And in 1962 or so, if I remember correctly, the first drop of heavy water in India was produced. And subsequently, we had several things. So he was just looking what is the easiest way and a way in which India will be least dependent on foreign countries. Okay, In the long term, you have to have something where you are least dependent. Because now imagine in today's situation, if something is denied to you, a certain program completely collapses. This is not, not a very good situation. So that, that's, that's how I think it was. And uh, he was quite open-minded for any university, any place. Of course, I mean, what Professor Rajaraman says is also true. The knowledge has been concentrated in DAE and nuclear knowledge and things like that. Probably one has to look, look back to what, what, is, what is done. However, we have been very open, like I have been myself going and giving lectures in Mumbai University to teach them how, how is the nuclear energy done, what do we do, what chemistry we want, what kind of a separation sciences we need. We need so many things. A nuclear reactor is not a simple machine. It requires so many technologies, so many knowledge of so many different subjects. And we need all of them. We need the best of the people to do that. So certainly. And I think these two people were complementary to each other. I will say it like this. And uh, Baba was a big dreamer and so was uh, Vikram Sarabhai. But Sarabhai had an element of administration built in uh, in his approach, which basically came from his background coming from a business family. So he knew how to execute things. And that also, uh, I mean, pushed the program much faster. Obviously, he started the space program and he would have done that had we not had we not lost Dr. Baba. But then there was a time when he was heading both space as well as this. And he gave this in 1970 or 71, this famous 10 year program for space and atomic research. And he was able to, to manage both the things. So these two people coming from a very similar background, rich families, staying together in uh, Bangalore under the uh, professor under Professor C. V. Raman. And uh, they, they, they could achieve this. Of course, uh, it would have been much better had a larger group of scientists participated in that. And I'm really sure country would have definitely benefited. I certainly agree with Professor Raja Raman on this aspect. But history cannot be undone. <laughs> yes. Any other uh, views or comments? Um... So one of one of the things about universities doing nuclear uh, technology 
there's a real problem there. I mean, I completely sympathize with what happened then. Problem of employment. After the India-US nuclear deal happened in 2008, uh, it was felt that suddenly there will be growth in the number of reactors in India, especially foreign-built reactors. The question came, where will you get the manpower for handling that? So universities were then told, come on, set up some courses in nuclear technology, nuclear engineering. And some university did. I know Delhi University started a course. And a couple of other universities did. They had two or three graduating classes. By the time those students graduated, unfortunately, the fruits of the nuclear deal did not come through. Foreign reactors were not built except by Russia, which built a couple in Kurangulam. So these boys were all unemployed and they ended up going abroad. So there is a problem of matching. I mean, if, even if Baba had said the university should have people, that's good. But the problem of absorbing them was also there. Whereas in Baba's way of doing things, that problem was not there. Everybody was inducted into the training school. Yes. Everybody in the training school got yes. out and stayed there. So there are, I realize there are practical problems. And in heavy industry like this, maybe every university cannot really take part. But some mechanism has to be found where they take part in bits and pieces. Maybe they go in and out of the years. It's a difficult problem. I agree. Uh, shall we go to the question and answer, see if anybody is waiting to ask questions? Yes. Unless somebody from our panel wants to say something more. Uh, okay, let me just go to the Q&A. Uh, so there are four questions here. Uh, then let me also look at the chat box. Yeah, okay. So the questions, one is by S. Salini. How Dr. Baba ascended to the captaincy of nuclear energy, even before independence, sidelining Meghnasa's efforts? You can answer it. You can also correct the question. Anybody, you want to say something, Dr. Na? Shall I repeat the question? Yes, no, I have read that. <laughs> Uh, it's a long story, uh, and it's a complicated story, um, uh, which I have uh, written in the book. So uh, there are many factors involved, and um, so uh, one that is usually talked about is this uh, 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 close uh, relation with uh, Nehru and others, uh, which helped. Uh, Baba to realize whatever he, his plans were. Um, and even before independence, I don't know what you mean by that, because uh, things were being talked about um, even before uh, in the late 30s, uh, the industrialization of post-independence, how India would uh, uh, research and scientific research in India would take place. And people were thinking uh, of these things even before independence. An atomic energy commission, I mean, in some form was uh, there uh, even before independence. Another question also from uh, S. Salini is what progress have we so far achieved in our three stage nuclear program that Baba and Bill? I suppose Professor Vatsa is the right person to <laughs> comment on that. If you can, please. You're probably muted, sir. You are muted, Dr. Vatsa, put on your mic. Yeah. Ah. I mean, the three-stage program is an important program. However, it requires availability of certain, uh, certain resources. Now, what we need is we are currently at the second stage, okay? And then slowly we'll go. I mean, this is, uh, again, a very long scientific answer which one has to give on this, but I, I don't wish to uh, enter into that. Rather, I would take question number four when she says, when and where Baba and Nehru met for the first time. That's probably the fourth or fifth question in this day. Yeah. And that one is basically, I think it was 1937. And Baba, as usual, used to come somewhere in summer in India. And Nehruji, as well as uh, at that time, Indra Pradarshini, not Srimati Gandhi, they were traveling on a ship and they were together. They spent some time. And that's, that was the first meeting that they kept in touch. And in 1939, when Baba had come here, he got stuck and he realized that he cannot go back. So initially thought it will be probably six months. He'll go back maybe one year or so. And he was still trying. And then he looked around and found that you can equally do good work here, probably more so. And it's the duty of scientists, as he's famously quoted, it's the duty of scientists to stay in the country and build scientific schools equivalent to the best in Cambridge or the best, whatever you say. And that is one product is TFR. So that's that's where first time 
Nehru and they met, and they both liked each other because uh, we must remember, I think uh, Nehruji was BSc in physics. So he had that, uh, he had that touch of physics, but somehow his line changed to uh, politi politics. And, but that scientist was still alive in him. And whenever he talked to Nehru, he felt that this, the scientist is rekindled and he's able to uh, answer his queries. So he was pro science and technology, definitely. And he gave free hand to anybody who was on the right path to bring uh, new science and technology, particularly in terms of energy, because what we needed was industry and for industry, we needed energy. So it, it's the, this, the, this is the connection that was there. I want to say a few things about this three state program because I know something about it. Please go ahead. Uh, the three state program. Uh, the middle stage of the program, it was primarily directed at uh, the thorium resources that we have. Now, thorium is not a fissile material. On its own, it won't be. So you have to bombard it with neutrons and it will then be converted to U-233, which is a fissile material. So that's, that's part of the plan. Now, to do that, you need a second stage of, uh, you have to essentially have a reactor which you cover it with thorium and in that shield of thorium, you will find U-233 coming, being born, and then you take it out and separate it out uh, in a reprocessing machine. Now, the problem is that that process is going to be slow because even the first prototype reactor has, uh, first breeder has not yet been completed. It was supposed to be ready in the year 2010. It's now 2020, 10 years later. I don't blame anybody for it. It's a very difficult process. And people in the business know the difficulties in having a fast breeder reactor which is an essential part of the three-state program. The French have, in fact, abandoned it. They had a very good uh, breeder program uh, reactor called the Phoenix. And when they wanted to make it bigger, they just felt it was not economical. The other country we started it was the Japanese. They had a uh, fast breeder reactor, which had troubles after troubles after trouble. They have abandoned it. So except for the Soviet Union, and the US never went into fast breeders because it felt it was not economical. So most of the world, has in fact abandoned that route and we are still following it. And this is one of the things where we have to be careful that we pursue this not for religious reasons, that somebody suggested it for religious following. We may have to cut our losses, particularly because now uranium is not a problem. At the time when Dr. Bhava was thinking it was very fair, uranium was very difficult to get. But now restrictions will be removed. Because one never knows restrictions may come back again. The international political situation changes. So it's good to have the thorium technology with us. And there, is, there are experimental reactors worked out even now. We set up even now in BRC to deal with, learn to deal with thorium and so on. But the three-stage program is very, very far away from being completed because the middle stage is already problematic. Nobody's difficult. These reactors like uh, path breeder reactor, they are cooled not by water, but by liquid sodium. Now, sodium, you know, is a very uh, uh, dangerous material. Uh, it not only tracks through metals and so forth, it also catches firings. So the safety aspects of breeder reactors are very difficult to deal with. One way to take care of soft tree is to pour money into it. So if you put enough money in, you can make them safe. But countries like Finland and so on have decided not to do that. It's just too expensive to make it safe. So there is a problem here. We can probably, in my opinion, we should continue some small stream of close uh, cycle research anyway, but by and large, go back to good old uranium, which is what we are in effect doing. India is building eight more reactors. They'll all be using natural materials. So that was my answer. Now, we have one important question from my colleague, Dhruv Raina. Uh, I think yes. you might want to answer that. Okay, I'll try. Uh, uh, so the um, uh, Professor Raina has uh, written, the panelists have um, presented the scientific side of this polymath mind. It would also be nice to know about the Renaissance mind, the relation between the Renaissance mind and the science. Well, I don't. Uh, I, the reason I uh, use that phrase, Renaissance man, was uh, twofold. Maybe uh, first of all, I, I think of. I mean, he was a theoretical scientist, a physicist. He was trained as a theoretical physicist. But at the same time, when he comes back uh, here, and then he, he he's building detectors. He's uh, flying balloons. He's uh, organizing teams. Um, to me, I mean, I'm a theoretical astrophysicist, but uh, you know, I find this very impressive that a person could have in his mind 
you know, all these things uh, uh, integrated in his mind. And that itself is a Renaissance mind to me uh, uh, as, a, as a physicist. Apart from that, he was, of course, he was, a, he was an artist. Uh, he was a musician. And uh, um, uh, he, he was a very well-read person. Um, yeah, his sketches are uh, uh, still there in the archives. One can see how uh, so. And uh, he, he has trained to play the violin for, from a very young age. And he was interested in a lot of things. Architecture, for example, the history of art and the history of Indian art. And which uh, influenced his cho uh, choice of architects who built his institutes um, uh, in TIFR and other institutions uh, that influenced his choice. So all this made me use that phrase Renaissance man among scientists. Um, second question is, uh, the, uh, he was in conversation with other Renaissance minds of his time. Do we get a feel of this world? Well. Uh, and the second, uh, third question is, uh, I mentioned the genre of uh, biography and science. What kind of biography would this be, if not the standard chronological narrative of a life? I ask because I have not read the book, but do plan to read it. Well, um, what I meant was not uh, the biography uh, in uh, this biography, but I suppose I wanted to uh, say that uh, when we talk about history of science, it's not just history of scientists. Um, the interactions between the, uh, the scientists and the, the how ideas get shaped, that's probably more important in the history of science than what uh, did a person do in this year and that year, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, that, that's what I meant, um, probably slightly loosely. Whether I have been able to do this, uh, uh, the, the conversation, with the other Renaissance minds of his time, there was a, a limit on the size of the book, by the way. So it was a commissioned book, by the way. And uh, the publisher was bringing out a series of, and which other books are also going to come out, uh, the series on pioneers of modern India. And so there was a limit on the, the format of the series. Um, so, so there was this, uh, so I don't, I don't know how much I have been able to bring this out, uh, the, his interest in other, but uh, whatever I could, I, I have tried. Uh, Thank you. There's one question which says, what do you think of Rocket Boys? I presume that refers to either a movie or a pop book. I, I have not seen it or read it. It's a series. Everybody else has? It's, it's a web series. Uh, oh, it's uh, a web series. Uh, OTT. Uh, acha, acha. So, uh, do you want to share your expertise with this question? I, <laughs> I, I must say that I was very, well, the whole idea of, you know, making a biopic, uh, a biopic like a series on Baba and uh, Saravai, it's just a very good thing, you know, to uh, make them familiar with the young generation. But I was very disappointed with factual, uh, there were lots of factual errors in this. And there were liberties, uh, that the script writers have taken, which probably one should not, uh, given the uh, the people we are talking about, there's a Baba and Saravai, and also they made Meghna Saha into a villain, which he was not. And, you know, as uh, Professor Mishra has uh, correctly pointed out, then, you know, they were complementary minds. It's not that, you know, they were uh, antagonistic or, you know, one should not make them in like a hero and villain kind of, uh, and which I think this series has made. So I was sort of disappointed by it. Well, uh, I thought that we end at five, it's 5.08. I'm very happy that we have a lively discussion going, but I want to ask our boss, Dr. Usha Munchi, should we be closing down? Usha Ji, please guide us. Oh, she didn't hear me, she can't hear me. No, I get no guidance. Uh, Kanchan Ji, should we close down sometime? Before they throw us out, uh... sir, you may close if you don't have it already five. You may close now also. Okay, uh, yeah. So I guess we do close. So let me close this now with my grateful thanks to all the participants for Thank your you patience very much. and for putting on putting up with my somewhat contentious statements and to Biman for starting this whole thing with this excellent book. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you. So we can all leave out the meeting now, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.